so one of the things that I frequently heard people complain about was uh, actually Emma's character. How everyone's like, oh, this is just dumb. Like, her plot is dumb. Um, but I, I think Emma is a really strong character. And it comes down to the fact that, like, of all the people in this movie, uh, at no point in time, even from the very first scene in the movie... Emma never seems to believe that the path she is taking is the right path, but she did get on this train and there's no real easy way to get off of the train at this point. Uh, it's like she's at a, she's a, a mother at her wits end or just a human at their wits end. And it's just like, no, let's just, you know, this sounds like a good idea, but she's clearly disillusioned. Uh, because at, like in every single scene where she talks about this is the right thing to do, they do a pretty good job of following it up with her like crying in misery somewhere, like she regrets this entire decision. Eleven realizes that her mom is, you know, precipitating genocide against all of the human race, so she steals the Orca, the technology that can talk to monsters, and goes to Fenway Park in order to lure all the monsters to Fenway Park. I like how they use Boston as the city at the end instead of, like, you know, New York or Tokyo again. Because those two cities have been really done to death. Not sure why. That's a good thing. Eleven successfully sets off the Orca, making all the Titans docile. To get... Why, why do you want to get all the monsters together? But sure, okay, lure them all to Fenway Park. Fun. Yeah, okay. Also, the other Titans destroying the planet showed up in Boston, like... I don't know, 20 minutes after being called, even if they were in Europe or you know, South America, where were they all going? Were they all going through the hollow earth or something? Ghidorah tracks down Eleven and the Orca in Boston. And of course, like nobody can keep track of the damn kid. Speaking of the, of the kid, Millie Bobby Brown playing Madison, she does a pretty good job, I think. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with her performance at all. It's not like next level great, but it's fine. The scene where Ghidorah zeroes in on Eleven and she screams up at it before Godzilla blasts it is so great. It ain't much, but I love Millie Bobby Brown's scream against Gizura, signifying mankind's defiance towards this alien creature. It, it, it's a little interesting to see her reacting to creatures crazy shit rather than being the cause of crazy shit and it's nice to see stranger things kids getting uh you know chances to branch out a bit and speaking of stranger things one of the uh, monarch agents is the science teacher uh, mr clark from stranger things which is pretty cool while not saying too much this movie does a lot to show that godzilla has a relationship with humanity uh like he is kind of on our side for the most part because hey we built him a house at the bottom of the ocean Hey, it's the Godzilla theme. Is it just me, or has he been working out? Final fight's cool. Godzilla vs. Ghidorah, round three. Fight! The most awesome part of the movie is when Godzilla was about to go thermonuclear, just walking through Boston, melting buildings and stuff, because he was so hot. It was pretty badass. Now, this is a kaiju battle. Human humanity joins the fight is, is what Kyle Chandler tells us. No, this time we're not just going to let him fight. We're going to be part of the fight. I also love the scenes of the military running ships over an underwater DC. Pretty cool. Followed by all the jets and helicopters rushing into battle with Godzilla. And so they like are shooting missiles at Ghidorah while Godzilla's fighting. Oh shit, it's Rodan! It got a bit squirrely towards the end and all the powers that the monsters have got uh, a little crazy. It's all pretty cool. Mothra tags in. It's a team up. I'm pretty sure this is Mothra's first ever non-cosmic weapon. She normally has, like, scales and space runes, but never an offensive butt plug. And, you know, Mothra's being Mothra, doing her Mothra things. Rodan vs. Mothra. Fight. But Mothra's pretty cool, and you finally get a chance to see where, where her stance is in the monster pecking order. Did... did Mothra just kill Rodan? And uh, she does actually beat Rodan one-on-one -on -one in a fight, which is pretty sweet. That was brutal. It's so hard to talk about this movie without just being like, yeah, yeah, and then Godzilla comes in, he comes, and get door goes, yeah, and then Mothra you know, swoops in, and Rodan, I still to this day have no idea how it was physically possible to actually fall asleep during this scene with how loud it was. But I absolutely, completely snorlaxed out when I saw this in theaters. 
I guess I was just so excited and so tired that when I finally got to relax my brain just decided to take a quick nap. I guess kaiju roars are soothing to me? I mean, maybe it was the orca sounds lulling me to sleep. Uh, Godzilla loses again for just a second and then Mothra shows up and saves the day. Oh man, that scene where Ghidorah drops Godzilla through the atmosphere is nuts. Unfortunately, it appears that Ghidorah then straight up murders Mothra, just disintegrates her, and uh, her energy falls upon the downed Godzilla, who's been getting his ass beat, and it kind of like, you know, I thought it was going to be one of those moments where it, when it hit him, he kind of like raged up, but he still takes quite a kicking after that, so I, you know, she just saved him for the moment. You know, every damn time, Mothra gotta take one for the team. This sucks! Eh, it's all fine. Ghidorah has Godzilla pinned down. It's not looking good. This is such a fun monster movie. And if you're looking for anything besides that in this, you're wasting your time. And it's well done, too. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm not one of those turn your brain off for every movie you go see, but certain movies do require that. And this is just a good, fun monster movie. How can you, how can you not understand that? You can actually see the monsters in this one, which is a nice change from the first Godzilla movie. Look, anyone who's going to bitch and complain about the realistic nature of a plot in a Godzilla film clearly hasn't watched a Godzilla film. Godzilla has been to space, for God's sakes. When monsters go smash, you can't expect Shakespeare. Sure, it would be nice every once in a while, but this is the nature of the beast, if you'll pardon the pun. I'm not really sure what people were expecting here. For real, man. Just, just sit back and enjoy it. Just sit back and enjoy it. 11's parents reunite and find their daughter buried in the rubble, but she's okay. The Russells work on fixing the smash device in the rain. The mom redeems herself by drawing Ghidorah away. Emma's death makes total sense. Mm, I did forget to mention how stupid it was that the movie tried to make me, like, really worried about whatever the woman's name was when she was, like, trying to run away from Ghidorah at the end. And I know that Emma's story arc is one that people have complained about the most, and I'll admit I have no sympathy for that character whatsoever. But I'm like, lady, you're the one who caused all of this. Like, so many people have died, and it is directly your fault. She started it. She has to end it. I'm not worried about whether you get killed by this giant monster or not. When she dies at the end, I couldn't care less. You can go ahead and get killed by the giant monster. It would be... Fine, But it's more than that. Emma didn't die a quick death. She didn't get caught by Ghidorah. She died by Godzilla's radioactive explosion, which is metal as f***. She was a terrible person, and I really didn't feel like she had any redeeming qualities whatsoever. You haven't redeemed yourself. And I really like his look once he's gone, like, full pissed off mode uh, towards the end there. Dude, Godzilla just went nuclear. Burning Goji, motherfucker! Oh, real quick, I want to talk about how he kills Ghidorah. <laughs> I was super duper hyped to see this guy appear on the screen. This is like one of the singularly coolest references because I feel like it just comes out of nowhere, like amping up Godzilla's radioactiveness to a point where like, yeah, he's basically just now a literal giant bomb. And in doing so, he becomes burning Goji. Scorched Earth. So when Godzilla gets all like nuked up and he, he's just bursting with energy, he's releasing these waves of like nuclear radiation, basically little nukes going off. And the first one like shreds Ghidorah's wings, like burns them away. And the second one like disintegrates two of his heads and it falls down and he stomps on it and crushes its chest so that all its electricity and crazy laser powers come like exploding out everywhere. He just f ate him. And the next time you see him, it looks like one of his heads is coming out of the rubble. And then you realize like, Godzilla's got the last head in his mouth. There's like maybe a, you know, a tenth of the neck section left and it's in Godzilla's mouth. So this thing's hanging out of his mouth like a tongue and it's still alive. It's still like, Mah! and he, uh, he's like trying to gulp it down and he stops and just blows a laser through it, disintegrates it. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Jesus. Good thing he's on our side for now. In the end, of course, Godzilla is victorious. King Ghidorah had a weird backstory and tons of powers. Not sure how that thing didn't win. It basically was better than Godzilla in almost every way. Aw, Rodan's okay. 
and stands tall as all the other uh, kaijus all get here all at the same time and, and bow to him. I also like the weird ending part where all the titans are bowing to Godzilla again after, you know, being in other parts of the world. But, you know, um, it is nice to see all the, the, mon- the titans bowing to him at the end. That was kind of cool. All the monsters swear allegiance to the new king, Godzilla. And we see the Mudos. And for some reason, there's a Muto there, along with some other weird-ass ones. So Godzilla doesn't hate the Mutos, just doesn't like sex. We see Mothra, we see uh, uh, Rodan, and we see a, a big tusked, like, woolly mammoth ape thing. That thing's the coolest. I don't, I don't know what the woolly mammoth ape thing is. Yeah, that one rules. I'm gonna go look it up right now. Hang on. The names of the Nantoho Titans were revealed as Baphomet, Typhon, Abaddon, Bunyip, Methuselah, Behemoth, Scylla, Tiamat, Leviathan, Sargo, and Mokolemebembe. The Behemoth is the name of the uh, the tusked ape thing, and that was that's my favorite monster. We didn't get to see it do much. That's actually one of my biggest complaints about this movie. Is you know you get a lot of Rodan and Godzilla and King Ghidorah and Mothra. But um, anyway, I digress. Monarch once again sucks at their jobs. I mean, at the end of the movie, everything's gone public, which is interesting. And then you see like a couple shots of other kaiju's doing stuff, and I don't know when you're gonna call this one King of the Monsters. I don't know. I just thought we were gonna get a little bit more monsters in it. Now, apparently, there's a lot of monarch outposts, which implies there's a lot of giant monsters out there all over the world. I hope we get like a Pokedex kind of thing for all the legendary monsters. Because I kind of want to collect them all. For having several Long Live the King quotes, uh, they use the word alpha in this movie a lot. To him, we're just less than flies. Oh, hey, it's the Blue Oyster Cult song. With a purposeful grimace and a terrible sound, he pulls the spinning high tension wires down. I do love the end stinger on this one. Papa uh, Lannister, I can't think of his name, but he's in this movie and he's the leader of the terrorists who were trying to let all the monsters out to destroy the earth. Uh, and he's he's going to buy a head of Ghidorah because when Godzilla and Ghidorah first fought, Godzilla ripped a head off but did not atomize it like he did later in the movie. So there's just a head around, and we know Ghidorah can regenerate, and now, now Papa Lannister's got a head. It's a brave new world, my friend. Such things as this become much more valuable since the rise of the king. My men, they don't ask for much. Can't fish here anymore. Everything's dead. We'll take it. And you know what they say, a Lannister always pays their debts. That doesn't make any sense. So what if in the new Godzilla vs. Kong, Dr. Sarazawa just shows up with an eye patch and a slight scar with no explanation, just to say, let them fight. Yeah, I know he took on a nuclear blast at point blank range, but still, it would be cool. Just saying. So I'm going to go into a crazy headcanon here. My wife and I came up with this. Uh, there's a 1969 Godzilla movie called Godzilla's Revenge. It's widely derided from the fandom. I personally love it. It's about a little boy, probably in the real world, Mindy Chiro, who is bullied, partly because he's, you know, obsessed with Godzilla. And he escapes from his bullies into this uh, fantasy world, which is Monster Island. And he goes and he hangs out with Godzilla's son, Minya. And they just kind of chill together and run away from Minya's bully, a big monster named Gabra, who happens to share a name with Ichiro's bully in the real world. And anyway, while Ichiro is fantasizing about this, lost in his own head, he gets kidnapped by some bank robbers, and he uses the lessons he's learned from Godzilla movies to fight his way out and get free. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff about being a latchkey kid and how culture is changing and how people have to work too much and they can't help their families anymore. It gets really depressing if you look at it too hard. But it's a lot of fun when you're a little kid and if you can put yourself in the headspace of a little kid. Anyway, my wife and I think that this Ichiro from Godzilla's Revenge grew up to be Ichiro Terzawa. 
Dr. Serizawa. <laughs> and I know that's lunacy, but it's fun. He's about the right age, too. Anyway, this movie is just so much fun. There were a few moments during when he teared up. Um, the aforementioned goodbye old friend scene. Also, when Ghidorah drops Godzilla, when Mothra sacrifices himself. If you're looking for more good cheesy kaiju action starring Mothra, Rodan, and Ghidorah, check out 1964's Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, Invasion of Astro Monster, Destroy All Monsters, 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, 1992's Godzilla vs. Mothra, and 2001's Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah Giant Monsters All Out Attack. I didn't make up that last one. Yeah, so that was King of the Monsters. Um, it was uh, it was good. I actually like this one quite a bit. You know, I want to put this movie higher, but it doesn't have the, the characters that Kong had. It doesn't have the charm that that movie had. It's closer to the 2014 version. Overall, I think the 2014 Godzilla is a slightly better m- movie, but King of the Monsters is definitely way more fun. My big takeaway from this movie is that Millie Bobby Brown is still an excellent actress. The sound system at Fenway Park could probably deafen someone if they put it up to full power, considering it can broadcast around the world, and that the monsters are basically walking cancer powered by radiation. It was silly. First, the marketing was so relentless that I felt like I'd seen half the movie before I was sitting in the theater. They tried to get some of that like adventure feel into this one a little bit, but it's, it's just... I don't know. I, I don't know what it is exactly. I don't know if it's because they're just so... Uh, missing on the, the human characters in these films like you know the last one should have been a Brian Cranston movie but they give us an hour and some chains of you know Kick-Ass and the Scarlet Witch I, you know it, it's a tricky thing because these movies are always all about the monsters and it's why people pay to see the movie nobody wants to go see a Godzilla movie like I can't wait to see what they do with the human characters I, I don't think that's ever been said seriously ever but you know you gotta do better I think like, I just Seeing this ridiculous family drama play out like the whole world at stake is just like, oh my god. Secondly, I saw all of the story beats coming. But I thought that that, uh, the plot with the humans was kind of interesting. I don't know. I don't know if it's the star power. I doubt it. I think it's more the characters and the writing, but it's just not... That doesn't do anything for me. So there's big chunks of this movie that just... There's exposition and just don't really work for me all that much. Even Bradley Whitford, who I normally think is the greatest, it's just like, eh. You know, you don't really feel anything when anything happens to any of them. And of course, most of them are totally fine by the end of the movie. But I don't know, man. You just... It's hard to follow up what they did with Skull Island, and I don't think this one succeeds. I do think it's better than the last one, but I don't think it's that great. I never realized it before, but there's definitely some cool mythological symbolism going on throughout this movie. This movie also delves deeply into the many spiritual implications that the monsters carry, especially as written by original series writer Shinichi Sekizawa, who wrote, among other entries, Mothra, King Kong vs. Godzilla, Mothra vs. Godzilla, Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster, and the pilot episode of Ultraman. And he wrote so much more. Sekizawa's debut as a writer for giant monster movies was on 1958's Varan, where a giant monster is worshipped as a god by native peoples cut off from the rest of the world. So he was very much the force behind the deification within these films of the kaiju. And this movie really updates those attitudes. It's really about accepting that that we as humans, we as individuals, are so small compared to nature, to the universe. It's about believing in something bigger than yourself, having faith in science, but also knowing our limits. The fact that that there was this group of humans that were trying to let the monsters out and the fact that like the first humans we meet in this movie who you think are going to be like the heroes are in fact like part of the plot to to release all these monsters and to like just let a lot of humanity be destroyed in order to let nature reclaim the planet i don't know i thought that was all kind of cool i'm sure all of that coupled along with numerous easter eggs throughout were meant as a love letter to fans and i do appreciate that but I've seen these films. It, it feels like every time they had a chance to really knock it out of the park, they hit like a solid ground double. You know what I mean? So that's what the movie is, like a solid double. You know, three, three and a half stars out of five, I guess. It's not bad. It's not great. It's watchable. It's entertaining at times. At other times, it's a little, ugh. But, you know, you put give me a choice between this or like the 98 Godzilla, and I'll take this every single time. And, and 
I guess I would prefer something that does more to pay homage while doing something different as opposed to telling me stuff I've seen before. I mean, my God, how many times does Mothra have to die? How many times does she have to revive Godzilla? And, and then he goes all Super Saiyan with his super breath and... I don't know. I guess the only real change in character development would have been Rodan turning into kind of a, a little bitch, siding with whoever's in charge. I mean, that was a little uncharacteristic of him, but hey, it was different. Sets up the whole thing, setting up Kong vs. Godzilla, really, and giving us some really cool action sequences in the middle. So I'm very curious to see how they're able to pull off Kong vs. Godzilla. If it's more of a Skull Island, or if it's more like this. You know, they definitely have been planning for this movie for a minute, and they definitely tease it more towards the end, where you see like cave paintings of a, a, a Kong fighting a Godzilla, or presumably the Godzilla. Who knows? But we'll see where they go with the next one. Hopefully, it's a really kick-ass, entertaining movie, and we get some Mecha Godzilla action or something like that. I know there's a bunch of rumors floating around about uh, Mecha Godzilla, but you know I kind of hope that's a red herring because I don't want them to try to cram in too much into this movie like Batman vs Superman did. I would feel kind of robbed if the Godzilla in the Godzilla vs King Kong movie wasn't actually Godzilla, but in fact Mecha Godzilla. I was one of the few people that didn't completely hate Batman vs Superman, but you can't do The Dark Knight Returns, Trinity, and Doomsday all in one movie. We only got one real fight between Batman and Superman before they teamed up, and I really think that's that movie's biggest flaw. If you're gonna do a versus movie, you gotta deliver. And uh, we can look at this one as kind of like, uh, well, they were building to it. <laughs> Perhaps in time, maybe I can find a new appreciation for this film when that new car smell wears off. But for now, as amazing as all that monster action is, it's just not enough for me to say it's everything I ever wanted in a Godzilla film. This one absolutely has some of the best kaiju action in movie history. Everything about the original series that is paid subtle tribute to in 2014 is paid loud, blatant, bull in a china shop tribute here, and I love it. And of course, we end with a shot at Skull Island and a headline that reads, What is a king to a god? Big ass monkey versus walking nuclear dinosaur. Who will win? Who's gonna win in Godzilla vs. Kong? You know, I'm not really sure. As for who's gonna win. Once again, the whole question here of who would win Godzilla vs. Kong just doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, we're at the finish line now. We're so close. You guys, I am so excited for Godzilla vs. Kong. It can't get here fast enough. Like, yeah, Kong in the last movie we saw is big, but Godzilla is still a hell of a lot bigger, and he's still Godzilla. Last time after watching Skull Island, I was pretty convinced that Kong had this one in the bag. I mean, how look at the stuff Godzilla went through in this, like, like really. But then Godzilla went Super Saiyan. Okay, so if you think that Kong can touch Godzilla after he gets nuked, and is melting steel beams just by walking within a few hundred feet of them, you're crazy. Honestly, by the end of this movie, watching those two, how he kills Ghidorah. <laughs> and he vaporized an alien dragon along with at least 20 square miles of Boston. I just don't see how there's any chance that Godzilla does not win this fight. Where you see what Godzilla's power level is like, where all the other titans are bowing to him and everything like that. Big smart monkey that bleeds when gets shot will get owned by the thermonuclear lizard. <laughs> Compared to what Kong did last time? Mm. So, no offense to Kong, but if you see Godzilla start glowing red, you best get up out of there. I'm very curious, like I said, to see where they go with Kong vs. Godzilla. If Kong's smart, he'll forfeit the fight. There's no shame in retreating Kong. I wouldn't want to fight Godzilla either. But I guess I'll find out next time, because I think what we're watching next is an older Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, because the new one's not out quite yet. We're about to get that fight going. I came to see King Kong and Godzilla throw down, and their moms better not be named Martha, that's all I'm saying. We haven't seen much of Kong, and in the novelization, he hears Ghidorah's call and basically like, I don't care. But we don't see anything of him in this movie. We just are reminded a few times that he's around. Uh, you know, Team Kong. I'm telling you, there better be at least three rounds between Kong and Zilla. Them the rules. I'm here for two hours of monkey on lizard action. Let them fight. No, seriously, just, just please let them fight. That's all I want.
so the next thing we're watching is King Kong vs. Godzilla uh, from 1962. I'm excited to see that. Um, I, I kind of liked those older ones we saw, just the, the first Gojira and the first King Kong, so I'm excited to see some more uh, old-school monster mayhem. I think it'll be fun. King Kong and Godzilla will return in Godzilla vs. Kong! Next time on Podcasters Assemble. considerably larger, about ten times the size of this gorilla's skull. Being instinctive rivals, there is no doubt that they will attempt to destroy one another. King Kong versus Godzilla, heading for their colossal collision, shattering every obstacle that stands between them in the most fantastic rampage of annihilation ever recorded on film. See King Kong stamp Tokyo into the ground, holding a beautiful girl in his grasp. See Godzilla destroy an entire army. See King Kong trapped by the blazing barrier of a billion volts. But nothing, nobody can stop the great showdown when King Kong and Godzilla meet to fight for survival of the fittest. Podcast as a Symbol is a production of the We Can Make This Work Probably Podcast Network. Find more of our shows at probablywork.com and learn how to contribute to future episodes of Podcast as a Symbol by looking us up on Twitter and Instagram at Cast as a Symbol or joining our Discord. The link is in the show notes. Submissions are always open. Thank you to everyone who's able to contribute to this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to where you can find them all online. Thank you. Oh God, please thank you. Music produced by Deft Stroke Sound. Opening narration written by Eric Slater and performed by Justin Aki. This episode was edited by Eric Slater. This has been a presentation of the We Can Make This Work Probably Network. Follow us on Twitter at Probably Work for more of our questionable content. Also, we have a website called ProbablyWork.com. The Papa 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 uh, Lannister. I can't think of his name. Um, Zhang Zhang Z. How do I pronounce that? It starts off with Mothra's easily. I did a butt, and we see a, a big tusk like woolly mammoth ape thing. That thing's the coolest. I don't I don't know what the woolly mammoth ape thing is. I'm gonna go look it up right now. Hang on. I actually got the Wikipedia page open, so we'll just scroll down. Oh nope, this is the Wikipedia page for Kyle Chandler. We meet Billy Bobby. Sorry. <laughs> we'll just scroll down here and you can just cut all this out when you edit this Eric and we can come back in uh, we can we can just leave this out and Dr. Mark Ro- um, let's see I love how Rodan very tactic da, 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 da. they wanted to acquire additional Toho characters but they couldn't get there Rodan, Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah um Godzilla, king of all monsters, or king of the monsters. God damn it. <laughs> the names of the Nantoho Titans were revealed as Baphomet, Typhon, Abaddon, Bunyip, Methuselah, Behemoth, Scylla, Tiamat, Leviathan, Sargo, and Mokolemebembe. Um, I have no idea which of those is the one I'm looking for.
Eric, don't just put, don't do any of this. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Titans. Let's see if this will tell me. Titans. Godzilla, Dagon? The crew takes a sub down to where Godzilla is to try and... The crew takes a dub down. (laughs) (sighs) King Kong, Mudo, Mothra, Rodan, King Ghidorah, Methuselah. Let's see. Dagon, not it. Methuselah, nope. Skyla? Skilla? Nope. Usually I'm Mr. Can't Shut Up, but it's just kind of there, you know. It's just fine. Behemoth. Yeah, Behemoth, that's it. Behemoth is a Titan who first appeared in the 2019 legendary picture Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Um, Yeah, that one rules. And, you know, Mothra's being Mothra, doing her Mothra things. And then I'll do the, the, the podcasters assemble. Is that good? My God. Zilla.